In this class we want to talk about government intervention in the economy. Um, back in the 1800s and the early part of the 1900s, the government was seen as having no role in the economy. The government was there to provide defence and law and order and some of the essentials of state. But certainly it was seen as having no role in the management of the economy. So this is a fairly recent idea in terms of the development of economic thinking and we can trace it back fully to John Maynard Keynes in 1936 who gave the government explicit role in the management of the economy to smooth out slumps in economic activity or booms in economic acti activity to try and level it all out and to plot a course for the economy which is in the best interest of the people. So it's quite a controversial area, it's a very political area and is much debated and it's still debated in the press. And in this session we want to look at some of the ideas behind government intervention. Now we know that in microeconomics that markets can fail. We can't leave it to markets entirely for various reasons. Um, it could be that there's bad information in the market and hence the market will move in the wrong direction or uh, will not adjust as we would expect it because people are trading at false prices and they don't know exactly what the quality of the good is or the attributes of the good. They don't, they don't know much about the market. So it can vary, it can fail for information reasons. Or it could be that it produces uh, bad effects. The market produces pollution, uh, for example which leads to global warming or uh, the, the destruction of environments. So there are many ways in which the market can fail and that's the subject of uh, a different class. But that's the, the microeconomic argument for intervention. So we need the government to intervene to correct for her the micro markets. John Maynard Keynes and introduced or popularized I should say uh, macroeconomics and promoted the idea of interventionism, interventionism by on the part of the government to control the course of economic activity. So the government, a bit like a, a captain on a ship, should steer the ship and should regulate the direction the ship is moving in. The same thing, the government should regulate the economy to make sure that the outputs are what's required by the people who live in the country. Now there are various macroeconomic reasons as to why the government should intervene but I suppose the stage was set for the interventionism of this type at the end of the Second World War when of course the government had to be very proactive in the uh, production of goods and services and in the pr improvement and rebuilding of the economy so that um, the world could again trade and prosperity could be returned. So let's look at the need for intervention. Well, there are microeconomic uh, needs for intervention. Um, the natural working of the economy some, sometimes can give undesirable results. Um, pollution. Uh, destruction of natural habitat for for animals. Um, so it, it can lead to outcomes that we don't want. It's not as if all economic activity is good. Some economic activity has byproducts which are dangerous or or simply wrong. So the government might need to intervene there. On the macroeconomic side, well, there are various explanations. For example, the government might wish to maintain a high level of uh, employment. So if you're suffering from high levels of unemployment, the government might want to get involved. It's also the case if, if inflation was too high, the government would want to get involved to bring inflation down to reduce the, the general price level because perhaps people can't afford the higher prices, perhaps they're uh, incomes are fixed every month or every every week and therefore they can't afford 
the ever-increasing prices and which and it would also lead to social unrest and perhaps trouble on the streets. The government also would want to have a high rate of economic growth. Um, we like the future to be better. We want to have different goods. We want to have more of them. We want to have a higher standard of living as measured by output and production. This is a controversial area because we're now thinking along the lines, many, many people are thinking along the lines, that um, economic growth is not necessarily desirable because it leads to global warming and the ice caps are melting and seas are rising and uh, we're, we're entering into a, an unknown phase of climatic change and we are the cause of it. Economic growth is the cause of it. So perhaps we should settle for less um, and look for low energy alternatives and not look for the variety of goods that we have been accustomed to. It's a controversial area, it's debatable, um, it's in the press quite a lot. The government might also want to intervene if it wanted to correct for a balance of payments um, problem. We trade with other countries and if we were persistently importing more than we were exporting then the government might want to get involved to try and change that to, so we could balance our trade with other countries otherwise we are going to run up persistent debts with other countries and at some stage debts have to be paid so we see various reasons as to why there is intervention of course depending on the political will of the country there are different uh, ways we can we can view this we can view it politically for example um, in this slide we've got economic systems which range, range from uh, left-wing communists to right-wing anarchy left-wing communists people who want to control the economy want to control uh, the output they don't want to have private business they don't want to um, have a private sector so in this case it's a 100% government on the right hand side we have anarchy we've left it to the market no government or perhaps a very small government just looking after some particular aspect of the administration of the country for example meeting dignitaries when they fly in or, or having a, a very basic defense force in between we have mixed economies and I think that's where most governments rest. Some are slightly to the left of the centre, some are slightly to the right of the centre, but we tend to be in the centre. So if we're going to have intervention, government intervention in the economy, it begs the question, how much intervention? Well, we can look at this in various ways. We could look ahead from a, a non-quantitative angle. We could say, well, uh, non-quantitative, the government should have legislation and force companies to do something. It's, it's intervening in the economy, but it's not intervening with fiscally. It's not intervening with, with money. It's not intervening with government expenditure or changing taxes. It's intervening through the, the legislation that it passes to, say, protect consumers and force companies to behave in a certain way by having company law, by having... Uh, labour market laws, by company, sorry, by having competition policy, forcing the companies to compete so we get cheaper prices and we get a more efficient production sector. Or we could have regional policy to make sure that some regions are not deprived compared to others and that everybody gets uh, a chance. There's also of course the quantitative government, uh, this is using government expenditure we can measure the extent to which government in, uh, intervention in the economy uh, is, is, is successful or not successful by looking at changes in the GNP or percentages in the GNP. Many economists think that governments should not be involved in more than 40% of the economy. If it's more than 40% it's seen to be more communist than capitalist. Finally, of course, the government can intervene by changing taxes, which alters our incentives, our incentives to work, 
to produce, to set up businesses, and so on. So the government can intervene quantitatively in different ways as well as non-quantitatively. Now let's look at the, the micro level. Well, government intervention at the micro level. Um, first of all, it, it, the government wants the market to work better. That's presumably the the belief we have to base it on. We have to believe that the government wants the market to work better and if the market does work better we don't need the government to intervene. So if we have the development of a monopoly which is a single seller of a good then the single seller can charge perhaps high prices because the consumers have no alternative. Well the government might need to intervene then to stop the company from abusing the consumers. We could have something called externalities, which I've mentioned earlier. An externality is a non-traded interdependence. It's something which we don't trade. Uh, it's outside of the market. It comes with the market, but it's outside. We don't pay for it. So, for example, people who go to university, that's, that's a market. They go to university, give up jobs, they, go, they give up their income, they pay fees, and so on. It's a market. But when they graduate, they become productive, they set up their own business, they employ people, they're better citizens, so we all benefit. These extra benefits are called externalities, they're outside of the market. Pollution is a negative externality. Pollution is something that companies produce, they don't compensate us, they, uh, they inflict it upon us through bad air, bad water. These are externalities. Positive externalities are the good bits. Education uh, was the example I mentioned earlier. So w with the market mechanism we have got um, externalities and these may require the government to intervene. We've also got this idea of public goods. Well, public goods are the goods that the market find difficult to produce. Uh, defence force the problem with the defence force is how can it be financed through the market? We don't have private armies. We don't tolerate private armies in most countries. We have the official government army, government defence force. We don't have competition between armed forces within a country. That would be crazy to have armies going out fighting each other just to be competitive. So public goods tend to be like something which, which the government has to produce. It has to raise the taxes and spend it in those ways. So government intervention is seen to be necessary there. We also have merit goods. The government supplies education. So does the private sector. But some people can't afford private education. So they go to public schools. These are merit goods. They're, th they're goods that we believe should be produced. On the other hand, the government should also intervene to stop demerit goods, for example the production of drugs or the production of explosives. It's deemed not right that people should set up producing drugs and sell these drugs and uh, all of the problems associated with drugs are then manifest and also it would be wrong for for companies to start producing explosives and selling them to whoever wanted to buy them so the government should work on demerit goods and stop their production that's the belief the government should also stop uh, gov uh, companies putting out bad information into the market perhaps information about their competitors or about the nature of their product and why their product is so desirable when in fact perhaps it's, it's not the case. So the government has to make sure that information is accurate. It should also encourage factor mobility. It sh should be able to encourage the market to set up uh, branches or factories in perhaps in areas where there's high unemployment to give other people a chance. It should also be able to encourage workers to perhaps move home from some areas where there are no opportunities to other areas and perhaps intervene to help them along the way. 
And the government also believes, or many people believe, that the function of the government is to intervene to make sure that the distribution of income and wealth is not is not obscenely skewed towards the rich. You don't have a couple of really, really, really rich people and the rest of the people are living almost in starvation. So it's believed that we should have some sort of fairness in the system, the government should intervene, tax the very rich and give it to the poor, or distribute it in a way that will enable the poor to produce more for themselves. So we've got various reasons as to why government intervention at the micro level should take place. Now let's look at the issue of government intervention at the macro level. Well, at the macro level, um, it intervenes for various reasons. For example, to keep inflation low, many people consider around 3% to be probably the max it should be. Now there are cases where, of course, countries have had rates of inflation into hyperinflation, into hundreds of percent a year. Some um, some countries have had inflation in double figures for a long time and have lived with inflation above 10 percent. But it's argued for monetary stability, uh, for for confidence in the currency and for uh, general um, economic well-being that inflation at under 3% is held to be about about right and the government should manipulate its activities, its income and its expenditure to bring about inflation at under 3%. It's also believed that the government should intervene to try and help bring about policies which will produce employment, to reduce unemployment, keep it keep the figures low which will help people to produce, it will help for a more efficient economy and less people will be dependent upon the state, less people will be dependent on welfare payments. And economic growth. Um, governments often look at what other countries are achieving in terms of economic growth and try to match it. This is, as I said, uh, this is controversial because we now recognise economic growth to be one of the contributors to climate change and maybe to the destruction of the earth. So that's quite serious. The balance of payments, as I said earlier, um, we we like exports to be greater than imports in value terms, but over a long period we like the two to be balanced because we like we like to receive goods from overseas and we like to export goods overseas. If we can get too balanced, our standard of living is much, much higher. Um, we we also want to, in terms of the balance of payments, we want to maintain the value of our currency internationally. Um, we like to have a high exchange rate. It makes us feel powerful. In fact, a high exchange rate can be a disaster for employment because as the exchange rate rises, the price of exports overseas increase, the price of imports falls, and uh, that can be destructive towards domestic industry. So a high exchange rate is not necessarily a good thing. It sounds like a good thing, but it's not necessarily the case. Lower exchange rates that uh, export, um, although lower exchange rates uh, exports goods will be cheaper abroad and also imports will be expensive so a s lower exchange rate, an exchange rate that's falling can actually be good. It encourages exports and it discourages imports. Okay holidays become more expensive, holidays overseas but that's the market, that's what we can afford. Um, we saw in the in the slide earlier about the left wing and the right wing in governments. Well, it's all to do with how we believe that resources should be allocated and should it be done by the market or should it be done by by planning. The distribution of income may uh, we may wish to wish to distribute from the rich to the poor, and this could be done by taxation. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, the policy is um, is difficult to implement because if we increase the rate of taxes on on people, they may go to live overseas. 
they may leave the country, in which case we're losing perhaps future taxation revenue from the same people, or we're also losing their talent. Perhaps they were talented business people and they're going to close their companies and go elsewhere. And the standard of living, well, we like that to be high, but as I said, with the the state of the the global climate and the changes in the global climate, that's something perhaps we need to reevaluate over time. Um, we need to take care of the environment, and this is a new area of concern. And we need the government to be involved. Uh, it needs to give leadership so that we can live out our lives relatively comfortably but at the same time we're not destroying the planet so that future generations will have something as well. Also there's a case that there's unwanted fluctuations in the economy, changes in the rate of inflation or the general level of economic activity and when this happens, when there are fluctuations we like the government to be there to to balance it out, even though it could it could actually make things worse if it gets the timing wrong or if it gets the 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 scale of the intervention wrong, because the governments don't know everything. There is sometimes a, an assumption amongst many people living in countries that the governments do know everything. The governments are just made up from individuals who uh, have to work with information the same as everyone else, so they may actually get it wrong. That takes us on to talk about something called targets and instruments. Well, the targets are low inflation, high levels of employment, balance of payments equilibrium, high rate of economic growth, and some sort of fairness or distributional equity that we talked about earlier. So these will be the targets. Now, the instruments, well, the policy instruments that the government may use to achieve the targets could be um, things like monetary policy, changes in the rate of interest. The government can control that. Now, the rate of interest is a very powerful tool because it influences the amount we save and the amount that's borrowed for investment purposes. So, the monetary policy is, is a particularly important area. Fiscal policy, it can change the taxation rates. It can't do it very rapidly, it takes time to change it, but, but it can change taxation and it can change the amount of expenditure that it's making in the economy. It can also regulate competition policy to make sure that the companies are being competitive and they are supplying the goods most efficiently and cheapest. And it's, it can have regional policy to make sure that uh, different regions are not deprived, are not being left out when economic growth takes place, everybody's sharing in the benefits and so on. So you don't get regional disparities, very, very wide regional disparities. The exchange rate policy, should it allow the exchange rate to float or should it fix it? And do we want a high exchange rate or a low exchange rate? Or should the market just determine it? So it has to pick some sort of policy related to the exchange rate which is our price for the international currency, the price of our currency as seen overseas. You could also have labour market policies, uh, national minimum wage for example, or conditions of employment, or uh, training, or health and safety. So there are many aspects to the labour market that it could implement. And it could have what's known as supply side policies. Supply side policies means it encourages us to to work so it it cuts taxes to give us more incentive to work uh, it cuts bureaucracy so that it's easier to set up a company to set up a business and if these things are successful the supply will increase onto the market more goods on the market more employment more prosperity so supply side policies um, so these would be some of the instruments. Now the targets, well, the targets are, it introduce, in, intervenes at the macro level to um, control inflation, as I said, unemployment, economic growth, to balance the balance of payments in the long run, 
to make sure the allocation of resources competition is working effectively and that the distribution of income there's not just a few very rich people and the majority are on the breadline to ensure there's some sort of fairness in the distribution of income and that the standards of living are rising because we, we want our standards of living to rise albeit that there is a conflict here with the global warming issue and also that we're not destroying the environment which is related to global warming but also we're not just polluting the environment around us we have a, a pleasant place to live now the instruments again if we can go back to those for the achievement of this well first of all we have fiscal policy which is just government expenditure and taxation it's manipulating those two to try to make the economy work in the way that the government wants it to work we have monetary policy which is changes in the money supply or in the rate of interest so the government can print money we can't print money the government has a monopoly on the printing of money so it can change the amount of money in the economy uh, it can take it out put it back in it can by changing the money supply it changes the rate of interest. The rate of interest is just the price of money. We have a demand for money and we have a supply of money. The rate of interest is the price. So if the money supply increases, the rate of interest may fall. So the government can use monetary policy. In the UK, the, uh, the power to change the rate of interest has been invested in the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Um, so the government doesn't actually make that decision it's it's experts within the, the Bank of England so the government has given it off given it to other people to make the decision people with perhaps better expert knowledge of the workings of the markets and, and how the economy is, is functioning let's look at fiscal policy first very briefly the, the government um, can use its budget to regulate the economy um, in in various ways I suppose but there are problems with the with fiscal policy changes in government expenditure take time for example to implement if the government is currently under contract to build roads it you can't just stop building them it'd be silly just stop everything and or if it had commitments contractual commitments it's very difficult to get out of those so it takes time to plan government expenditure and to stop it. Um, government programs can be long term, for example as I said road construction. And changes in taxation also take time. The paperwork in the tax offices has to be changed and people have to be retrained and computers have to be reprogrammed. So changing fiscal policy is not something that can be done quickly. When the government increases ex its expenditure then of course there will be more spending in the economy the more spending will lead to greater demand for goods and with more goods being demanded we need more workers to make the goods and when we have more workers we have less unemployment we have more people paying taxes and less people drawing welfare benefits so that improves the government accounts. So the government is priming the economy. The government's giving it the initial push and then the economy is doing the rest and the government doesn't have to stay in. The government doesn't have to stay pushing the economy. The government doesn't have to continually put money in. The economy itself should pick itself up. Um, the government may try to increase aggregate demand. Um, increasing aggregate demand means increasing government expenditure or by reducing taxes. We can do that if unemployment is high and inflation is low. Higher unemployment leads to a high un, sorry high employment leads to a higher standard of living and higher rates of economic growth. So high employment is seen as as desirable. Now to increase demand, if we're going to have an expansionary fiscal policy, the government's going to put more money into the economy to increase it, then we may have 
the government cutting taxes that would put more money into the economy because the, the, the taxpayers paying less to the government has got more disposable income as a result and can spend more and or the government can simply spend more it can it can start um, borrowing money in the markets and spending that in addition to what it's getting in taxation now contractionary uh, contractionary um, fiscal policy one cutting back on fiscal um, spending to reduce aggregate demand well you could do this if inflation is too high for example or indeed if the balance of payments is in deficit if we have imports exceeding exports if the balance of payments is in deficit and the government reduces its expenditure therefore there will be less money in the economy we will have less money and we can't afford the imports in that way we corrects the balance of payments so if we have less money, less imports. So if we're in a boom period, the government may wish to, to moderate it, to reduce the boom period. Now with, fisc with, sorry, with monetary policy, well, uh, this is changes in the money supply. Uh, the demand and supply of money determines the price of money. This is known as the rate of interest. Now, in the UK, the rate of interest is not set by the government, but it's set by the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Now, let's first of all look at an expansionary monetary policy. The government could lower the rate of interest by increasing the money supply. Now, more money in the economy, it may lead to inflation. It may lead to prices rising. So, cutting... Sorry, increasing the the money supply can be dangerous and there are problems there. Now with supply side policies, well here the government may increase output in the economy by improving the conditions of supply and there are various examples of supply side measures some of which I've mentioned earlier. For example reducing tax which gives us more incentive to work therefore the supply of goods will increase uh, reducing business bureaucracy, making it easy for people to set up businesses, thereby increasing supply of goods on the on the market. Improve education so that people can see opportunities and exploit opportunities more easily. Um, com improve communications to facilitate business to business contact, business to consumer. Uh, it's easier to do business when communications are uh, are better, when communications are stronger, so that improving communications would help setting up business and increasing supply on the market. Improve health so that the workers are healthier and can produce things. They don't have time off work because of illness. Better technology, better uh, technology within the the country, for example, the provision of broadband internet, uh, the provision of better communication circuits, as I said earlier, um, better transport systems. So all of these things can lead to um, better um, better facilities for production. The better facilities lead to more supply onto the market and hence supply side more people in work and that's the the essence of supply side policies now let's go back to targets and instruments again for a second well the government cannot attain all its goals at the same time because some goals conflict with others this is one of the problems of economics that's been observed generally to get more of one we must have less of another Sometimes we call it zero sum. In other words, some people gain, some people lose. And there's very little we can do about that. Sometimes there is a, a trade off between two desired outcomes. We can't have both of them, we can only have one. Now, these policy conflicts, well, uh, examples um, of, the, of the, the conflicts could be high growth and a balance of payments. We want higher growth because we want more goods, but higher growth means we have more money, more money, more imports. Balance of payments is in deficit. 
to get the downwards appearance back on track we have to reduce the the amount of uh, activity in the economy which leads to unemployment and reduced growth. Both of these are contradictory. We can't have both. There is a problem here. Inflation and unemployment. It's been observed that if you reduce unemployment inflation will go up. Inflation will increase. If you cut inflation unemployment will increase. You can't have low inflation and low unemployment and there's, there's reasons for this which will be, become obvious later in the course. We have the growth and, and the environment. We want more, we want better standard of living, we want more growth and we know we're wrecking the, uh, the environment. Nothing we can do about that. So that's the the, the policy conflicts. Now what we've done in this session, it's been quite a lengthy session, is we've gone across policy instruments, policy targets, we've looked at ways in which the government can intervene in the economy to try and bring about greater prosperity or, or to achieve some particular goal. We've seen the conflicts that if you try to do it, you hit problems elsewhere. Uh, each one of these are important and each one is discussed in the press continuously. This is the, the the daily discussion that we get in the quality press about politicians and the decisions that they've got to make. So it's important for us to understand them. Okay, that concludes this class. Uh, thank you for watching.